welcome to episode number four of Street Smarts, where we're helping you level up both in and out of the game. And we've finally come to the episode that is super important and something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is commentary. Now, there's a lot of things that go into commentary, but we have two very special guests here today to help us with all of it. First things first is how to make a reel. And we're going to be learning that from Chris Seglia from Tano Media, who also has helped so many events within the community, and he is the perfect source for information on how to make the best reel you possibly can. But of course, you got to think about the meat and potatoes of what's going into that reel, and we're going to be speaking with none other than the one and only Say Jam on tips to better your commentary. Of course, we're going to have the Q&A sections with them after their segments, but don't forget, you can submit your own questions in the chat right now for everyone tuning in during our webinar. There's also a Q&A section. If you hover over the screen, you'll see at the bottom that there's a Q&A button. You can submit some questions there too. And of course, you already submitted a few questions with your application. So we're going to go over those as well. For everyone tuning in to the VOD, welcome. And you're definitely going to be able to learn something as well, even if you can't participate in our polls. So speaking of polls, we asked you guys a few questions before we got started, and we're going to get a gauge at where we are today. So we first asked you how experienced you are with commentary, and a majority of you said you haven't tried it yet, but you think you would be good at it, which is great. You're in the right place. And then we also have a few of you who've commentated locals, regionals, and even some major events. So not to fear, we're going to have something for everyone today. We also asked you another question, and that was, do you have a reel ready? And a whopping 86% of you do not, but a few of you do. And trust me, you are going to learn some very important things about making an amazing reel in just a few moments. But we did hit you with one more poll question that is obviously a main factor behind street smarts in general but narrowing it down to commentary we asked how are you looking to grow and a majority of you want to improve at public speaking but honestly all the things on this list are something that we should always improve on especially if we're hopping on the mic so i'm really looking forward to sharing some information with you guys and also talking with two guests that are gonna basically change the way you think about commentary and what you know so far. So I don't want to waste any more time. I really want to get into it because this is going to be really fun. So let's go ahead and kick it over to Chris Seglia. My name is Chris Seglia. I'm the CEO and executive producer of 10 LLC. Um, the way I got started in this business in esports is that I was already doing sports production. And one of my friends who was really good at third strike called me up and said, Hey, uh, there is a underground arcade happening in San Jose, California. You should come check it out. And, um, and I did, I showed up there. I was, uh, I got thrown into a double, uh, double elimination, um, random select tournament. And my first opponent was John Choi in super street fighter four, the first day that it was out. And, uh, I got double perfected by John Choi. I don't even think I got a fireball in or anything like that. So I decided I'm never going to play this game ever again, but they were streaming it. And my friend Hans was, uh, was streaming it. And I decided to walk over and I checked it out and he, and it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. I said, this is great. We should keep doing it. And that's kind of how I started. I kept went back ever since. Commentary reels are important because uh, it gives us a glimpse of how good you are. Um, it allows us to um, see if you're committed to actually creating a reel and cr uh, committed to the craft. Uh, it also shows uh, how good you are. You know, if you're a great storyteller, if you can do analysis really well for your uh, particular game. Uh, it gives us a glimpse into that and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll check you out if you're any good. Some do's and don'ts for, uh, for commentary reels, uh, include, uh, you got to make sure it's a reel. What a reel is, is, uh, is under three minutes and three minutes is a very long reel, um, of your compiled clips of you being uh, a commentator and you commentating over gameplay and things like that. Um, a common mistake is uh, uh, not, I don't know who you are. You have to introduce yourself. Uh, so I would highly suggest putting your face 
um, as one of the first two clips, introducing your reel or uh, doing an introduction of sorts so that we understand uh, who is speaking. Um, this, a second uh, common mistake is that uh, you make it way too long. As I said, three minutes is a, is a long reel. Um, we typically only look at the first minute of a reel. Uh, and if it's really good, we look through the first two, uh, 2.30. So I would highly, highly suggest putting your best foot forward, your, your best uh, clips at the very, very top to make sure that you're uh, representing yourself uh, in the best light. And a, a great example of a reel is Say Jam's reel. The whip punish, man. Gosh, Kun, a lot of resources on this. He's getting close to being able to kill. Sets out. V-Trigger uses the kunai to get rid of it, but he spends a bar. Big sure he can jump in over it. Yeah, and he had, had to, to respect it. it. Had to stop it. Oh, the crush. That's going to do it. Let's go. Oh, oh, not in range. Activates the block, though. And the V-Reversal gets Tokido out. Flash, Flash kick. kick. The answer, Tokido, making sure he feels the pain. Oh, he can demon actually. He's got the meter available. Ooh, the demon it. in the night. He called it, and the demon comes out. Already taking a drink. The demon in the night, tying things up. Say James reel uh, is re very good. It shows his uh, hosting abilities. It shows his uh, analytical abilities uh, for different games, and it also shows his storytelling abilities. He makes every clip condensed and succinct uh, so that it uh, so the reel very much uh, moves and flows uh, throughout that entire three minutes uh, another great uh, example is Persia's reel she used to uh, uh, commentate for us all the time uh, but now uh, she used her reel to get a, a job at GameSpot. Microsoft stores all over the world are hosting qualifiers. So right now, let's check in with Nicholas Victoria at the Microsoft store in Mississauga. Hey, Nicholas, how's hey the tournament progressing up there in Ontario? Everything is He cool. has quite a lead right now with five points. Ghost is goon trying to catch up real quick. Gets pulled back up by the lift. And Ooh, nice Donut shot. was on the chase, but goon kept oh. his composure. One more shot for goon, nice. and he gets the double kill. Very nice. Yeah, Sniper was there for that entire battle, but only saw one kill out of it. Mm -hmm. All because of positioning. You have to be ready, and the perfect kill from Sniper gets taken down right afterwards, but... That's the nature of FFA. Yeah. That's how it be. It is. Some examples of reels that are not so great is uh, when you actually don't make a reel, um, uh, or they're incredibly too long. I've gotten reels that are hours long. I've also uh, gotten just timestamps of, uh, of tournaments that you commentated at. So um, one person sent me about 80 links to uh, two different uh, tournaments that they've commentated, and they were all about four hours long. I'm not gonna go watch that, I'm sorry. Even if I was bored one day. Um, I did click through his links just to make sure that I wasn't missing anything, but um, I didn't know who was talking and I didn't know who was commentating. So, uh, you know, that, that reel definitely uh, didn't make the cut. Uh, a second example on the complete opposite end is if you don't take it seriously at all. Uh, there was one time a uh, a pretty well-known commentator thought he had a, the job in the bag and he sent me a reel of two words that he said. He also didn't make the cut. So uh, I highly suggest uh, you take it seriously and you actually create a reel that showcases your abilities. <laughs> As a new commentator, there's typically two ways to uh, to gather your clips that, that you need to create a reel. Uh, the first one's a little harder. Uh, it's uh, to commentate over YouTube matches or VODs uh, of that nature. Um, the reason why it's so hard is because it normally involves two people. Commentary normally involves two people. So uh, you're gonna have to do solo commentary um, and uh, you'll have to do analysis and play-by-play -play and be the storyteller all in one. Um, so that's a little hard for some people, especially for people who are just starting out, but there are examples of that happening very well. I think Toon from the Smash community uh, sent in a reel uh, of him commentating over some YouTube clips and it was amazing. So, uh, and he got, he got a job at Evo for that. So there are ways of, uh, there are success stories for that. Um, 
The second way is if you volunteer at a smaller or a larger event, but typically a smaller event is uh, the way you get your foot in, uh, in the door. If you become a uh, part of the backbone of the tournament, uh, you're always reliable. Uh, you you do very well, and uh, you adhere to uh, whatever rules the the tournament organizer or the the streamer has for you. Um, they're going to see that you're going to you're improving throughout the uh, entire time that you're uh, commentating their particular tournament, and uh, it'll help you uh, get um, get clips for your reel, as well as uh, they might recommend you for. Uh, for different gigs it's you know the saying is it's who you know and you can build out your network of people that way a good rule of thumb is a basic reel is probably the best reel um you don't need a crazy microphone you don't need a crazy uh a camera or anything like that you don't need any of those fancy things as long as we're able to hear you clearly and see you at a at a certain point throughout the reel um you're you'll be completely fine um in fact, if you utilize some crazy editing or tricks with your camera or, or crazy lighting, it might distract from what is actually the content that we need to, to move forward. Um, some people use an editor for their reels. I think that is uh, not great. You know, it's pretty easy to, to edit things, uh, especially for a reel, because it's only about two to three minutes, right? So, uh, you know, putting that together and listening to your own voice and making sure that it's you're getting the, the correct clips is great. One way that um, some commentators uh, do this, especially if they're streaming as well, is to get their community involved and help, have them help uh, select the clips that are the best, that showcase you the best, and that will help you with your editing process for sure. Storytelling is a, a very important part to commentary. Uh, it brings everybody uh, along, f uh, along for the ride with you as well. So what, what's happening on screen? What is the historical aspect to, uh, to that particular match, if there is any? Uh, what is the vibe of the room? Is everybody getting crazy hype? Or is everybody, uh, you know, is it a snooze fest, essentially? Um, but you, uh, you want to uh, bring the energy and the storytelling uh, with you so that people at home can understand what is going on at that particular tournament. A great example of this is Yipes. Uh, there's no particular story that, that I can think of, but uh, he's just an amazing storyteller as it is. He utilizes his musical background as a lyricist to, uh, to help um, create uh, amazing moments, uh, not only through uh, his commentary, but his storytelling abilities. Um, He's just amazing at that. And if you ever get a chance to watch Yipes commentate live, you know, forget the match. Um, you should definitely just watch him commentate live one day. And it, it's amazing. And then on the other side of the spectrum where Yipes is crazy energetic and uh, and uses his lyrics to, uh, to push the match, you kind of have a little bit more dry analytical commentary, uh, which is amazing anyway. And that's Seth Killian. Seth Killian uses his historical knowledge to build how how important each match is. He knows every fireball that Daigo has thrown since 1982 or whatever, or however long Daigo has been around. So um, there are definitely two different aspects and different ways to story tell. Um, two different; those are two different versions. But it's up to you to decide um, what works for you as a commentator. You just finished your reel um what next um i highly suggest making it as readily available as possible uh, for casting calls or or um, job opportunities or anything like that but you should definitely post it on as much social media as you feel comfortable with um posting on your youtube channel posting it on your facebook you know making a pinned tweet on twitter um you should definitely uh, have one on Vimeo with a password just in case you're you're shy or anything like that. But yeah, that's what I highly suggest doing. And um, you know, people might click on your social media and see that oh wow, you're a commentator as well. Let's check that out. And maybe there's an opportunity there. Um, 
for producers of uh, of events and, and tournaments and things like that, usually there's a casting call when uh, when there's a need for commentators. So uh, typically for Evo or for Combo Break or for CEO or something like that, about two or three months in advance, we say, hey, get your get your reels ready, send it here to this designated area. And that's how we start uh, getting reels uh, for everybody. I would highly suggest not cold emailing people or, or DMing people your reel. Um, usually that's pretty annoying, but um, you know, who knows, it, it may work for you, it may not, but I highly suggest not to uh, do it, especially while a tournament is happening or um, while a, a season like for the Capcom Pro Tour is happening, because usually we have those pretty set early on. If you do want to cold email somebody, um, I would do that before the the tournament season begins. So probably in January or March or something like that, uh, I would I would send your reel. But uh, to be honest with you, um, I would wait for sure until those casting calls are are, are needed. So you've submitted your reel. Congratulations. Uh, that is a, an important step for sure. Um, so for example, for Evo, about 50% of the people who apply and send in their reels don't actually send in a reel. So you've already made the first cut. Um, just so you're aware, uh, for Evo, we, we typically get anywhere from 200 to 1,000 reels per game. So uh, there's a lot of reels that we have to go through. Uh, our process is uh, typically seeing a if you've created a reel, uh, you made you made it through the first step, and then b we we get a group of your designated game. So if it's for Street Fighter Five, uh, we get tournament organizers or commentators or players or people who are just fans of the game to come in and kind of be a focus group to filter out who's uh, the best for your particular game with uh, reels only um, doesn't matter about historical uh, or anything like that then uh, after if you've made that next cut then we send it to another games focus group so for smash brothers or for tekken uh, if you're a street fighter commentator you might be um, getting it watched by a blaze blue uh, fan if you can keep their interest for those two and a half to three minutes that your your reel is there, uh, then you've successfully made that next cut. So, um, and then it usually comes to me as the executive producer, a producer uh, for that particular game, uh, the developers, or uh, somebody higher up that makes way more money than me. Um, then we make our final cuts from there. So that's kind of what our process is like, um, and that's kind of what you should expect. You know, for any particular game, like last year at EVO, we had over 60 commentators for the entire event, but we had way, way, way more reels sent to us. So, um, you know, if you're not selected for your reel uh, this first time around, I would highly suggest uh, updating your reel uh, as much as you can for the next time uh, you do it. And that's, that's kind of what you should expect, but you should definitely keep going. Um, you know, thanks for, for listening. Uh, I hope you've learned something. I don't know why you listened to me, but you did. And, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'm ready to take your questions now, if you have any. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I know that was a lot of information to take in, but it was all amazing information. But now we have Seg here, live and in the flesh to answer your questions. How's it going, Seg? Good, is that what I sound like usually? <laughs> yes. <laughs> now you can probably see why everyone's always like, oh my God, Seg's voice. <laughs> but um, I think it adds to like, the ominous, like, Seg is always watching you, so you better always be on your point and commentary I vibe. Am watching. 
always watching. Um, but yeah, you guys are already submitting some really awesome questions and we're gonna get to as many of those as possible right now. And starting right out of the gate, um, I'm gonna jump just right into these questions because they're, they're really good, especially when it comes to the real. Uh, Alejandro asked, is there any value in adding foreign language clips in a reel? Because uh, in a particular clip might be good, but if the person watching it doesn't understand it, you know, what's your opinion on that? So I would suggest doing that, at least putting one in for, for your reel, but it really depends on who your audience is. If your uh, audience is going to be a English speaking, uh, uh, you know, tournament or something like that, then, it, you know, typically we don't ask for uh, different languages, but um, you know, if it depends on what gig you're going for, I, I do suggest putting one in just to, so that you can uh, showcase your range. And, you know, esports is an international thing. You never know when someone in your area or maybe in another country that, you know, speaks the same language you do, you do is looking. So even, you know, you mentioned having your real read, readily accessible, and that's a good way for people to find you if they're looking for something that not other people can offer. There's very few bilingual commentators out there. Um, our next question was, Dan has heard that five minutes is also seems to be a standard for reels too. Do different people have different requirements and how, you know, stern is this three minute rule that you're speaking about? It's not incredibly stern. Like if it's a great reel for five minutes, then sure. Like if you're, um, if you're keeping my interest throughout the entirety of the five minutes, you know, whatever, that's, that's great. But, um, I do suggest that you get your point across in the first minute to minute 30, uh, or else people are turning it off no matter how long it is. So, you know, it really depends on what, uh, how good your reel is. Sometimes less is more. So our next question was actually from the applications and it was, is there a particular style of commentary that you're looking for? Or when you're looking, is it more about the game and the event? It's mostly about the game and the event because there are so many different types of commentators, you know, say James a little bit more analytical, but he can do play by play and he can, he can be the, the general host as well. Tasty Steve is hype. Like he's just a, a, a ball of energy. And um, yeah, I mean, so it really depends on what your strength is and you should identify that once, uh, once you decide to create your reel. And I think that kind of plays into our next question here. You know, you mentioned, you get thousands of submissions sometimes. There's a lot to sift through and a lot of, you know, aspiring commentators. But when you're watching all this footage, what stands out to you? What really sets someone apart after you've already watched 300 reels or so? My biggest thing is pacing. Uh, if you can pace uh, well to create uh, a story, essentially, um, well, I guess storytelling and pacing are the two big things that I'm looking for. Uh, if you can uh, extend the hype of the match, uh, that is very, very helpful and uh, it makes it easier uh, for people to, to say yes. Because if you're, um, like if I was commentating a Street Fighter match, um, I would need somebody incredibly, like a Tasty Steve or somebody like that to help me carry through the energy of the match because I'm pretty low energy. So uh, keeping the pace of the match, knowing when to go crazy and when to, uh, and when to be analytical um, you know, is, is very, very necessary. So we did have another question in our Q and A section from Paxton who has experience in for tournaments and commentary, but for one specific game, is there anything that you could recommend for anyone who's trying to expand to multiple games, even if they don't have that same amount of experience? Uh, get it, get that experience. Uh, <laughs> at some point, you know, it's going to catch up with you. Uh, you know, being a multi-game commentator is hard. Um, finding your style is huge and trying to figure out what is, uh, um, what works for you. And if that's marketable throughout the entirety of each game, that's great. But usually uh, you're going to need at least some sort of base knowledge uh, of each game or else you're going to, you know, end up looking like a fool. And so will the person that hired you. All right, so we have to make sure that everyone here in our webinar is staying on their toes. So we're gonna hit you guys with a pop quiz that Seg is gonna be grading afterwards. So make sure you answer it correctly. 
Not saying it'll be make or break, but it might be close. <laughs> so when starting out, what can you do to practice? Volunteer for events, commentate over YouTube clips, start streaming to get used to talking to an audience, or all of the above? Submit your answers now, and let's see where we're at here. Ooh, okay, what do you think, Seg? You all fit. I know, you did a good no, that's correct. <laughs> a few of you failed, like 13. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all of these things are very important. So, you know, if you pick one, you're still technically right. But all of these things are very important to practice. And honestly, a lot less of a high pressure situation if you're able to sit in the comfort of your home, look at a YouTube clip, commentate over it, kind of learn more about yourself without the influence of other people's opinions, which it's not always a good way to learn because you start getting in your own head. And the most important thing is that you love these games and this is why you're on the mic. It, you should never be going into it thinking, I'm gonna learn this game to be a commentator. It's all about that love first. So yeah. All right, we do have some more poll questions for you guys, of course. Um, we've been talking a lot about reels, obviously. So our next question is going to be, what do you need in your reel? All right, your name and contact info, a clear shot of your face, your top moments, or all of the above. Feel free to answer this. And this question actually leads me into another question, but I'll wait until you guys get your answers in so we can see what you think. Let's see those results. Ooh, another answer in favor of the all of the aboves. But I am going to ask a question based off of this poll to you, Seg. And the name and contact info in the reel, how important is that or not? Incredibly important. Uh, I think that that is something that, uh, you know, sometimes you submit the uh, answer or your, your, uh, your reel and there's no like form to fill out. Be like, hey, my name's Chris Seglia. You know, I'm, you know, I do this game, that game, and here's my phone number and here's my email contact. Or you just misspell it or, you know, like you, there's a typo or something like that. That happens all the time. So uh, making sure that that uh, contact info is correct is, uh, is huge. So we have another really interesting question uh, from the Q&A section here from Freddie, who, um, and the reason I'm asking this is because I think it's something I also was in my head about for many years, but how much does voice tone matter? Um, if I have a high pitched voice, is that an issue or vice versa? What do you think? Nope, it doesn't, doesn't matter very much. Uh, I think that uh, as long as you're good at the pacing and the storytelling part, you're gonna get through no matter what. I, you know, um, I have a very low voice and raspy voice that people think are, is good for commentary, uh, but uh, I am a very bad storyteller and a very am very bad at pacing, so uh, it would not be good for me to commentate. But you know, um, voice the uh, voice tone does not matter that much. So keep that in mind, you guys. Don't get stuck in your own head. Everyone hates the sound of their own voice, but if you're on the mic or you're trying to get on the mic or you get any opportunity to be on the mic, then you're already going in the right direction. So another good question from the chat is, if you commentate multiple games, do you want a reel for each game or is it better to kind of show your variety? Again, it's knowing your audience and what you're going for. It's just like a job interview essentially. So if you're, uh, you should have a general reel being, it being the one that you kind of just send out um, on social media and all that stuff. But if you're going for a street fighter for commentary gig, you should probably put uh, only Street Fighter 4 clips in there. And one more question here um, from Matt. He says, how much do you have to know about a game technically to be a commentator? I love talking and commentating, but I always feel like I'm not knowledgeable enough on the game. So I pointed this question out because I feel like, you know, even as a commentator of games that I'm very knowledgeable of, there still is a point where you always feel like you don't know enough or you could know more. And that's just a part of learning and being a commentator. But as someone who's seen a bunch of reels, what's your take on that? Or have you seen people submit reels for games that it's very clear that they don't know a lot? Or what's your thought on that in general? So you should have a base knowledge of the game and the mechanics, right? Um, you should know, like if you're going for Street Fighter V, you should know what a V reversal is, like and how, to, and how that happens. Uh, you should know um what anti-airs are and you know just the basics of the game um 
it really depends on also on who you ask but me personally i think that game knowledge is is pretty high up there uh especially for um uh for like a pro tour or things like that we will take chances on people who we think could be great commentators and don't really have that knowledge of the of the game sometimes if we're you know like for evo for example we have 60 uh commentators uh we sometimes take chances on people who don't really have that uh, that game knowledge but we think that could be uh useful in the, in the future kind of thing so i do think that it is uh necessary for game knowledge um and if you don't have that game knowledge, it's also very necessary to be good at asking a question to your co-commentator or of uh, trying to figure out on the fly what happens. You know, people, there are apps that have frame data. There are, um, you know, l looking at various different resources. Uh, you just have to be good at it. Uh, if you're looking at your phone for 95% uh, of the, the camera shot, it's probably not great. Let me just expand a little bit on something you just said. And you did mention it in your segment before about making sure you're showing your face because it's not always clear who is actually speaking. But even beyond that is, you know, you shouldn't put too much of your co-commentator in your reel as well. So at the end of the day, this reel is actually about you, right? So do you have any tips for anyone, especially those cutting together their own reels on getting that really good clip and how to manage the clip if their co-commentator is in it a little bit too much. You know, I think having a co-commentator in there is good uh, for some clips for sure. Uh, I think that seeing how you play off of a commentator or how they, you know, if they ask you a question, how you respond to that or how you uh, ask questions to them. Um, if they're in it too much, that's probably a bad clip. So it is what it is. Uh, you just kind of have to find that balance of, you know, um, like, in a, like in a replay for basketball, uh, this is going back to my sports route. Uh, usually when you see a replay, you, you always get the pass uh, beforehand and then you see the shot or the dunk or the layup or something like that. So you, you want the, uh, the context of, of that uh, for some of them. But um, yeah, you should, it should definitely be more about you than your co-commentator. All right, so let's hit the chat with one more poll question. You know, we're always making sure you guys are paying attention. And this poll question says, what is something you shouldn't do when it comes to your reel? Add all of your clips to the reel, curate only your best clips, highlight your personality, or make your reel easy to find or access. And while you guys are answering that, um, a really interesting question from Alejandro that you know, it's really something I've never even thought about, but they're asking, is there such thing as a co-op reel? Like maybe a commentary duo applying together? That sounds really interesting. No. <laughs> uh, I mean, there is, I mean, you can do it, but uh, most people won't do, or most uh, hiring uh, managers won't accept just a duo. Uh, mm -hmm. You can, no, I just wouldn't do it personally. <laughs> All right, well, noted. We're all learning something here today. All right, let's see those answers. Ooh, okay, this was the, the don't. Are they right? Three of you have failed. <laughs> yeah, 3% of, of you, you know, although highlighting your personality is, uh, is a good thing, you know? Yes. Obviously, it won't be the only thing you're showing, but it is a good thing. All right, you guys, now let's hop on over to Say Jam's segment. Chris said we'll be back later on for our group Q&A. So if you had some questions that didn't get answered, don't worry. I might have saved them for later because I feel like Say Jam and Seg can shed some insight. But now we are getting to some commentary tips for those of you who are looking for more information or are already commentating and kind of want to see what the next steps are. That's what we're getting to now. It's going to be really awesome. So let's just head on over to Sage Jam. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome to Street Smarts. And I'm really excited to be here today to talk about commentary, which if you follow fighting games at all, you follow Street Fighter, you know that I've done a lot of commentary. It's been my job for four years now, which is incredible and also very lucky. 
but it's something that I care a lot about. And I wanted to sit down and try to help maybe anybody who's up and coming or maybe even people who are experienced with commentary help have some more clarity about, you know, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing, what are some mistakes people might make and just how to kind of get into the flow of things once the day arrives for commentary. So that being said, if you don't know much about me, I got into making videos back in 2010 when I first started uploading videos on YouTube. And at the time I had no interest in doing commentary for anything i just wanted to make youtube videos because it was a cool hobby and for my birthday i begged for a capture card because i just wanted to make a video and put it on the internet because i to me that idea was so cool i just really enjoyed that and years went by and i was more interested in fighting games eventually i got into going to fighting game events starting in the beginning of 2013 and i got asked like many people if hey you over there can you come talking to this microphone and tell people what's happening on this match so I just sat down and I did and I was like, you know, doing commentary at the time. I didn't know that I was going to do it very seriously and I wasn't very good. In fact, I was awful. If I ever hear myself from that era, it's like it immediately gives me a headache just to listen to how I used to sound. But I, I didn't know what I was doing and I was brand new. And, you know, that's how most people sort of start in these kinds of things. Right. So after I did it, I really liked it. And the person I did it for said, you weren't that awful. If you ever want to do commentary again, come by. So I started going back, uh, you know, to Super Arcade, which is the local place I went to play uh, fighting games at at the time. And every once in a while, I would jump on and do commentary. And I did that more and more for years and years and years until in 2015, I was officially asked to do my very first tournament I got paid for ever. And I was like the most excited I had been in my entire life. I'd been commentating for over two years at this point, And I had been offered one job where I was gonna get paid. And it was just like the greatest day of my life. I went to the event, my hotel was like super far from the event. I had to like walk all the way there and it was like 100 degrees outside in the summer. I didn't care, it didn't matter. I, I think we ended up like driving because we were like, we have to drive, it's too hot. My hotel didn't have a working door, so I couldn't even close the door properly. And so I slept in the bed far away from the door so that if someone broke in, I could leap out the window and hopefully be safe after the two-story fall. And uh, yeah, that was my experience. And I was so happy. Like it was seriously the greatest thing ever, despite all of the details going on. So that was the very first time I ever got paid to do commentary after five years of making videos, after two years of doing commentary at events. And then the next year after that, I took the jump to doing commentary full time when I met Tasty Steve and he is the greatest human being to ever live. So our commentary naturally clicked. We got into commentating and we've been doing it full time ever since. And since then I've traveled all over the world, all over the country. I've done Evos and Evo Japans and Capcom Cups and finals for tons of different fighting games everywhere. And it's just been like maybe the best thing that could have ever happened to my life. I have the greatest job that there ever could be, and I'm always happy to do it. So if somebody's ever interested in, you know, getting involved in commentary, they often start in the place where I did where they have no frame of reference on how to begin. So my job or my goal is always to try to give you as much advice as possible and kind of give you the tools or maybe understanding that I didn't have when I got started because uh, commentary is a very difficult thing to get involved with. So I figured uh, we should talk about it a little bit. Yeah, so when getting started in commentary, I think there's tons of easy mistakes that people tend to make all the time. And I don't really blame them for making them because when you're starting out, you know, most of the time it's from the same place that all of us started out with, which is we're interested in the game. Whatever you want to commentate, whatever you're interested in talking about, it could be anything. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be Street Fighter. It doesn't have to be fighting games. It could be whatever your favorite hobby or sport or, you know, just activity that you do. It could be anything in the world that you're just the biggest fan of that you want to talk about all the time. And most of the time that comes from being a competitor and being someone who is involved in the scene in some way or taking the game seriously. And that's kind of how I got started as well. The big mistake that I think a lot of people have is they come at it from a player's perspective. So they know a lot about the game. They're very interested in their community and stuff, which is fantastic. That's what you need, but they are not experienced speakers. So they don't have a lot of public speaking practice. They don't have a lot of practice on, you know, kind of going through the motions and that's okay. Uh, right. I think that's something that's totally fine because I would much rather take someone who is familiar with the game, familiar with the local community, the regional community, major community, communities around the world than someone who is a practice speaker who knows nothing about fighting games. I'm sure all of you have tuned into a stream 
And you've heard someone before who sounds fantastic. Their voice is great. They're really trained on public speaking, but they don't know much about the game. So I think knowing how to get, knowing the game, but not knowing how to commentate is a very normal first step for most people. And that's okay. If that's you, then that's totally fine. You're where 99% of us started. The other mistake I see a lot of people make is that they're overly critical of players and just mistakes that happen. As a commentator, you're not your job isn't to hide mistakes. So if someone drops a combo, it's not, oh, he went for a reset, like he dropped a combo. You can be honest about that. But what you have to be aware of as a commentator is that this is a match between two players who are under a lot of stress, who are in a situation that's very nerve-wracking in a tournament format. And so explaining exactly why a combo drop could have happened, if the combo is difficult, you know, explaining why mistakes happen, that kind of stuff is very important. And you don't want to be overly critical. Never be the guy on commentary who's like, if that was me, I would have done this, this, and that. If that was me, then I would have hit this combo or done this thing. Nobody wants to listen to that. If you were that good, you'd be playing in the match in the finals of the tournament, right? That is one of the ways that you'll turn people off very quickly. And it happens a lot in our community where people just are very negative about the matches or what's happening. So, you know, just be aware of that. Another mistake I see quite frequently or something that you can get slipped up on is remembering that when you're doing commentary at locals, it's often silly and fun. But if you're doing commentaries at regionals or major tournaments, don't change that. Uh, a lot of people, when they get to a, you know, a bigger tournament, they're like, they have to you know get all buttoned up. They have their shirt and tie. They're all serious. And they're like, welcome, everybody. And they're just, they're not in their element. They're not having fun. And I think it's important to remember that no matter what the stage is like, uh, you should be yourself, right? Be the person that got you to that position and just have fun, stay relaxed. And remember that at the end of the day, it's a video game tournament. You're not commentating, you know, the most important uh, speech in the world. You're not doing some address to the nation. You're just talking about video games and video game tournaments. Casual is okay. In fact, please be casual. And the other thing is that you have to kind of know that when you get involved in commentary, you shouldn't expect it to be your job. You shouldn't expect it to pay the bills. You shouldn't expect it to become your life. Commentate because it's fun and commentate because you enjoy it. Expecting anything more from commentary, especially at the beginning, I think is a mistake. I started making videos 10 years ago on the internet for fun as a hobby when I was in high school. I never took it seriously and it didn't become my job until six years later. And even then it was a very shaky start and it was like a really dangerous position and it was like really scary. But it ended up working out okay for me. But that's just one example. That's just one case. Just do it for fun. And if it turns out to make you some, you know, extra money on the side at events and it turns out you really love it, that's fantastic. But just be like very aware of the expectations you set when you come in. So after you've worked on kind of some of the mistakes that you have, and don't worry, they're mistakes that everybody makes, you have to get ready for a tournament. You have to start your prep. Now I'll say most of the time when you're commentating, you're going to start locally. And that's the most important place to start, right? Whatever your local community is, you sort of just see an open microphone, you walk over to it and you start talking, right? That's how all of us really get started, whether it's an arcade, a local event or whatever is going on. And obviously right now there's much less local events in the world, but that doesn't mean there's not tournaments in your local area that are being streamed online that you can reach out to and you'd be surprised how often somebody's just like i have no commentators there's just nobody around who can do this i need anybody anybody who just walks up who knows the littlest bit about the game please help us out in some way or some shape or some form so you know start locally reach out to the people around you who could use some help whether they're streaming a tournament and commentating by themselves and just juggling all this stuff not everybody's spooky not everybody can do you know a million jobs at the same time it's very difficult so start local and then begin to reach out to larger events. Start looking for regional events, start looking at your monthly events, and work on a reel. A reel is maybe the most important ticket to getting larger events. And what a reel is, is just like a two to three minute cut of your work. And when you're creating a reel, I've talked before about some tips to kind of do it, but first things first, please open up with your face on camera so people know who you are, what you look like. They see your big smile. They see you saying, hey, what up, everybody? I'm Sage. I'm here at this made-up tournament, and we're going to get into the finals. It's going to be awesome. You need to see you. That's one of the most important parts. And the second thing is it doesn't have to be fancily edited. It doesn't need a lot of like crazy cuts. Just make it very simple. Just you know your best work, show some uh, great matches, show you getting excited, show you delivering a little analysis. That's all you need. Put that reel together and start sending it to tournaments that are in your area or larger events and see if they're interested in hiring you. As far as prep goes for the actual events or preparing for the game and stuff, uh, I'm notorious about having tons of prep work all the time. And the way you prep is in a variety of 
different ways. If you are prepping for a game that you know very well, you want to dig into the nitty gritty. So you want to start to look at, you know, the players that are going to be there, the characters you're likely to see. You're going to want to really study the habits that these players have and start to think to yourself, if a player is going to show up on stream, what will I say about them? If Daigo is walking to the stage and you have 20 seconds to explain one of the most decorated fighting game players in the world, what would you say? That's the kind of stuff that you can practice outside of an event and just in the mirror or practice it on your own stream by taking footage of Daigo at some tournament or something like that and watching it or as online matches. You can prepare that kind of stuff ahead of time. And one thing I would say about prep is you can never be over prepped, if that makes any sense. So for me, there was an event where I studied super hard for Smug and I studied super hard for Bonchan, two players you see all the time on the Capcom Pro Tour. And I had prepared super hard for both of those players. And at that tournament, I didn't commentate a single second of either of them playing. And six months later at Capcom Cup, they played in a match that I commentated and I was super prepared because six months earlier, I had prepped really hard for both of them. So no prep is ever wasted. You'll run into those players again. And even if you don't run into those players, if I'm preparing for Smug, who plays Balrog and G, and I'm preparing for Bonchan, who plays Karen and Sagat, I prep for those characters as well. So if somebody else plays one of them, I'm familiar with it. Your prep will not go wasted. Uh, you'll be better at prepping over time. You'll get faster at it. You'll get more thorough at it. So don't be worried about prepping for something that's not going to happen, right? Just do the prep you can and just be prepared for whatever situation because you can never be too prepared is the way I think. Another bit of advice that I would say when you're getting ready for tournaments is... Be aware of the importance of improv. Uh, a lot of events, as you guys know, there's fires everywhere. If you're at a tournament and nothing wrong is happening, that's the scariest thing I've ever heard in my life. That doesn't happen. There's always things uh, just going wrong everywhere. So sometimes you're going to have to fill a lot of time. Sometimes you're going to have to spend a lot of time working with people you're less familiar with. And being able to just kind of you know, gel with them and being aware of the situation, having your improv skills tested is a big thing about commentary. So be able to fill time to chat about the events, chat about life, talk about stories about you coming from the airport and trying to get to the event. Just have some stuff prepared kind of in the in the back of your mind of if I have five to 10 minutes at this tournament where nothing is happening, what, what will I say? You know, have a little flow chart. One thing that you hear commentators do a lot is they say, this event's really great. Here are some of the big, you know, matches we've seen earlier. Man, these these bracket matches have been out of control. They've been so fantastic. Who are you excited to see do well or who do you think is going to win? And if you hit that fifth spot where you're kind of running out of things to say, it's like, hey, man, what'd you have for lunch? You know, you sort of, you eventually kind of run out, but that improv will really help. And the last bit of advice for prep, and it's one that commentators, even at the highest level, sometimes don't think about, is sleep. Uh, just get get your eight hours of rest. If I don't sleep and have coffee before I commentate, I'll be cranky. Everything I say will be wrong. My hair will be messed up. Just get some rest. Make sure the night before, if you're going to wear any clothes on commentary, if the hotel has an iron, iron all the shirts you're going to wear. Uh, get eight hours of sleep. Be prepared for the matches you're going to you know run into. Show up with a snack. Show up with some coffee or like an energy drink of some kind. Just be ready for it and make sure to take care of your body because the more tired and broken down you get, the harder it is to commentate. And remember that oftentimes, especially if you get hired for long events, you might be commentating two, four, six, eight, ten 10 hours a day to pace yourself, you know, make sure that you don't burn out in two hours, your voice is hoarse and gone. And tomorrow you're supposed to do a big finals day. There's nothing left in the tank. So just take care of your body, show up prepped and ready as prepped as you can be and get some sleep. Trust me, sleep is like your greatest ally when it comes to commentary. Your your brain will be working faster. You'll feel snappier. You're, you're not going to mix up your words as much. You'll feel like a hundred million times better if you sleep the night beforehand than if you stay up all night you know, playing matches and all that kind of stuff. Trust me, sleep. So the next thing to think about when you're getting into commentary is the big day. You're going to jump into the tournament. The tournament's about to start. You're really excited. Maybe you're nervous or something like that. And you're going to jump in and you're like, this is it. This is the day I'm commentating some tournament that's not my local. It's a regional or maybe even a major event. And, you know, there's a lot of like nerves flying around in your stomach. You're like, what am I going to do? I'm about to be on this big stream. First bit of advice, and I touched on this earlier, is be yourself. Don't show up. If you're a hype commentator, don't show up and just be like, hey, what's up, everybody? We're here at this turn. No, bring some energy and be excitable, right? You're never hired for an event 
to be the person you're not. They don't watch you commentate, see your reel, and think to themselves, I want to hire that person, but I want them to do something completely different than what they just did. That has never happened in any situation ever. They watch you, they like the things you do, so they want you to commentate their event. And if you're a silly person, if you're like a really excitable person, if you're a really boring person like me, they hire you for that. They don't hire you because they want you to be someone you're not. So show up, and as much as you prepare, as much as you're excited for it, just be yourself and have fun and do the things you enjoy while you're commentating because that's what got you there in the first place. Don't ever shy away from you know, who you are and how you'd like to commentate because there's tons of different styles out there. If they wanted to hire me or if they wanted to hire someone else, they would hire us, right? They hired you for a reason, so just show up and do the stuff you wanna do. The second thing is think about who you're gonna commentate with uh, that day. I would say be very aware of the other people you're paired with, right, when you get your schedule. Think about their styles, think about the things they're good at, right, and how you play to those strengths, just like you think about a matchup. If you're gonna fight against a certain character in a fighting game, you think to yourself like, what does this character like to do, right? You think the same thing. If you're like, well, I'm gonna commentate with this person. I know this person has a lot of energy. I know they really like to do this, so I'm gonna you know, commentate to their strengths and to my strengths. and just kind of have some awareness about what it's likely you're going to commentate like and what it's likely your co-commentator is gonna sound like on that day. And just put a little thought into making sure that both you and your co-commentator are comfortable. If you can see them sometime in the day and talk to them before you start, especially if you've never worked with them, that always helps. Just getting like kind of the gauge of how they are as a person will really help you feel comfortable commentating alongside of them, right? I think that's why the best duos in any genre are people who are very close, people who are very familiar with each other and are friends. So that even outside of commentary, they just have kind of that natural bond that makes it so that when you listen to them, they sound very natural. They know exactly what the other person's thinking. That kind of stuff is hard to create unless you've met them, talked with them, formed a like relationship with them as co-commentators and you're familiar with what they like to do. And the last bit of advice, this is like the secret advice that will really save the day, is when you're working with production for an event, when you're gonna go to your local and the streamer's there, who's been there four hours before you, who's gonna be there until two o'clock in the morning tearing down and setting up and all that kind of stuff. When you're gonna work with a regional event where there's a massive stream and some big company is gonna be there and some large streamer is gonna be there, or when you're working the largest events in the world where there's you know production trucks and TV trucks and all that kind of stuff, no matter what, say hi to the production. Just say hi, see how they're doing, be familiar with them, be familiar with the kind of cues they're gonna give you because every production company and every production person is gonna be different in what they do and whether they talk to you and whether they have like um, you know some kind of messages they send you, whether it, they're giving you the information via text or voice or whatever it is. And also just having like a rapport with them really helps you understand what they're trying to do and what they're about. So when I show up to an event, I always walk backstage, I talk to production, I'm seeing like how they're doing, you guys all doing okay, everything is life good. You know, like how's everybody doing over there? I'm like, oh, it seems like that was a big problem earlier. Just kind of have that uh, discussion with them to see how everything's going, get a sense for the flow and the rhythm of everybody involved. Much like working with a co-commentator, if you understand the feelings and thoughts and everything about the people working on the event, producing the event, the people working the cameras, all that kind of stuff, it creates a more cohesive feel to everything and you feel more involved. As being a commentator at the event, your job is to deliver the narrative and tell everybody at home what's happening and deliver the action. And the more broad your scope is and understanding of the event you're working on, the better you can cohesively pack that all together. So, you know, having a feel for how production likes to work, having a feel for how your co-commentator likes to work, and remembering to be yourself through all of that will really just make sure that when you show up to the event, you do exactly what you're supposed to do and everybody's happy at the end of the day. And that's what matters the most. And when it comes to working with people, sometimes, it just doesn't work out right away. I've had people who I'm super close friends with in real life. And when we sit down on a commentary booth together, it's it's pretty tough. There's just that kind of weird tension of us being friends, but being in a professional environment. I mean, myself and Vicious, who you've seen on a lot of Capcom programming, we've known each other for seven years now or something like that. And there was like this little while where him and I could not figure out how to work properly on commentary it was just like one of us would be too serious and then not serious enough and it just sounded like you know one of us was like doing the most serious like out of control this is super focused and the other one was just like haha he shot a sonic boom and it just it sounded so bad and you know that kind of stuff can happen with people you're very familiar with and sometimes i'll work with people where i sit down and i feel very good about how everything went and i'm just like super surprised by it and then afterwards they're like oh, i was so nervous i don't think any of that went well i'm sorry that i did bad and i'm just like 
what everything was great like it was unexpectedly awesome everything worked out it was a slam dunk and i've had people i worked with who are fantastic commentators say like you know i was really nervous during that block i'm sorry i did bad and i think sometimes you can get into your own head about that kind of stuff and the reason you're there is because you're awesome in the first place so even when if you're working with someone who's a huge commentator even if you're working with someone you don't know who they are you don't know their background or anything you know, they're there for a reason. And I think most of the time when you sit down and you just try to work it out, even if it doesn't go right the first time, even if you guys don't gel in the way you want to, eventually it'll work out. Sometimes you sit down like myself and Steve and it just works from the very first time we ever worked together. And sometimes you sit down with someone and you're just off rhythm. There's just two different things going on. And I think both are okay. You just want to try and be as flexible as you can and work with whatever strengths and weaknesses your co-commentator has, no matter the situation. And if you give it your honest go, it doesn't maybe work out. That's okay. That happens. It happens to everybody, even people who have been working for years and years and years in commentary. So don't feel bad about it. Another thing about events is like, personally, I really love laid back events, stuff like the summits that have happened in the past and stuff where you guys are just kind of relaxing, chilling on the couch. Many of the Red Bull events have been this way. The more relaxed the environment, the more fun you get to have. And as cool as it is to sit in a giant arena and have all these people behind you or work on television and stuff like that, those are almost never the most fun experiences you'll have as a commentator. So, so oftentimes I see, especially new commentators are like, you know, I'm working on my local, I'm working on my regional. I want to work on these big events. And you know, these, these big events are big events for a reason. And they're really grandiose and they really are special to the community. But because of that extra bit of size and because of that extra bit of pressure, oftentimes it finds like kind of the balance of more stress and more work than just the kind of fun environment you have at your locals and regionals. And I think until you get in there and do it, it's hard to see it. But when I'm at a local event or when I'm at some kind of like traveling sideshow event where everything's just goofy and silly and I'm commentating Jenga at some off event, that's when I really just have fun. And I remember the kind of reasons I love doing commentary. And, you know, at the other big events where you're commentating these huge grandiose stages, like you're too focused on doing the job to remember to have fun sometimes. And so for that reason, I would say if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I'm only doing local and, you know, regional events or my monthlies or something, I really want to work on these big stages. Uh, you, you'll make it there if you keep working. But also remember that those events you're working on right now are the fun stuff. So there's nothing wrong with enjoying that. Another thing is it's very natural to get worried or anxious or stressed out before something. In fact, if you've ever played in a tournament match, you know that there's just this feeling that you can't replicate outside of being in competition, right? And so what ends up happening a lot of the times, is especially before you start, you just have all these nerves, there's all this energy. And once you begin, most of the time, you don't even remember that you're nervous. You don't even remember all that energy. You just kind of go in the flow of everything and you're having fun. But if you do find yourself nervous, there is something that I stress all the time to players and commentators and people on stream. And I say, you know, one thing that I was teaching when I was a coach for uh, different sports and stuff like that is a lot of the times people will say, I want to, you know, work out until I don't get tired anymore. Right. I just want to keep like doing whatever I'm going to do until I'm never tired. The thing is, everybody gets tired. Let's be honest. It doesn't matter how good of shape you in, you're in. Eventually, you'll get tired. The goal is not to work out until you don't get tired anymore. The goal is to work out and get used to being tired and know how to function in that environment. So no matter how tired you are, you know how to still give 100%. And a lot of the times, being stressed out or being anxious or being worried is the same kind of way. Not being stressed out and being worried about an event is difficult, right? I mean, you're going to be on camera in front of lots of people. You're going to be in a crowd in front of lots of people. You're going to be in an arena or on television or whatever it is. That kind of environment, it's just naturally nervous. I mean, even commentating something at home in your bedroom, you know, wearing a t-shirt and wearing nothing underneath and commentating to viewers on a stream on some local, even that's stressful. Anything like that is stressful. Streaming to 10 people is very scary. But the thing is, is that you only really improve at it at living in that environment, being used to the stress, being used to, you know, kind of conquering your fears and getting over it and doing that kind of stuff. I mean, public speaking is like maybe, I think it is the number one most like, common fear that people have even more than like anything else that's scary out there like spiders or snakes or sharks or whatever people are afraid of public speaking is like number one so it's pretty natural to be nervous or afraid of it so it's going to take you time to get used to it but 
just live in that environment, get used to it. And if you really love it, you'll probably figure it out eventually. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning into this episode of Street Smarts. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. And hopefully I've helped you at just a little bit in understanding commentary. I think the series is really cool. So I was super happy to be involved with it and super happy to just sit down and talk about commentary, which is basically what I do any day, every day, anyway. So I hope you, you know, have some questions here that I can help answer. And if not, you at least get to sit around and chat with Persia, who is also an extremely fantastic commentator. So let's go back to her. All right, we are here and Sejam is here with us live as well to answer your questions. I've seen already that you guys have been sending them to us. Keep sending them our way because we're going to be able to ask Sejam these questions. I also have some questions I think will be really helpful too. So send those on over. First things first, what is up Sejam? How's it going? <laughs> uh, yeah, life's great. How are you doing? Good, good. Excited to talk to everybody about commentary because it's really exploded over the last few years. And, you know, the state of commentary has kind of changed. So I think this is yeah. super crucial in helping people learn how to get into this space in this current day and age. So with that said, can you explain some of the differences of how commentary was, you know, back when you and I both first start, got started before things were as like official and grand as they are now, you know, can you talk to a little, a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that's a great way to think about it because I kind of think about it like the wild west, right? Like there's a few <laughs> people who are established and they did a lot of events and stuff, you know, and uh, you would hear about those people, you would see them often, but really it was like whoever was the closest possible person you would just grab them like a, it's like a night at the Apollo. You just grab like the cane and you just hook them over to the stream setup. And you're like, this is your life now. You're going to tell <laughs> these people what's happening on the stream and that's how it'll work. So comparing that to how it is now where there's established people who commentate, people are interested in being a commentator or getting into commentary in like an official capacity. It, it's very different because for me, I wasn't even interested in it when I started. I literally just got dragged over and people were like, hey, we need someone to speak into this microphone you do it. And I was like, me? Uh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a very different feeling now than it was then uh, for sure. And that was only, you know, five, six years ago. Exactly. I honestly feel like a lot of the commentators that we know and love now all kind of started out like that. I remember my whole, yo, Persia, oh, we got open chair all on screen, <laughs> all on stream, by the way, yes. you know, with the empty chair in the shot, you know, spooky off camera, but you, you just hear, hear the headset voice. rustle, <laughs> like the, the headset is just like coming off someone's head. They're like, hey, yo, we need a person. And you just like walk over there. You're like, hey, what up stream? How's it? Oh, I got to go play my match. I'll catch you guys exactly. later. And you just walk away right after you sat down. You're like, well, Exactly. So it is definitely different. Um, but I definitely don't think that means that, you know, it's impossible to get into it now. Like St. Cole is a great example. He's been killing it this year and he's been doing great work. And honestly, I feel like he's been growing more during, you know, this whole time where we're on like work from home status pretty much, but he's still been advancing and growing. So that's also a really good example that, you know, you guys can still put in work despite the current state circumstances but let's hop over to some of the questions from the chat because you guys have some really good ones and I'm going to kick off with a few that are in regards to um, your co-commentator right because we've been talking a lot about our own personal skills how we can improve our own personal commentary but there's more to it once you're sitting yeah. down and you're with your co-commentator you kind of have to adapt it is like its own fighting game almost you have to learn how to adapt and change your style sometimes if your co-commentator are doing a variety of things like which we're going to get into this question here if your co-commentator makes a mistake such as providing wrong information for a move do you politely explain the audience the right information because there is limited amount of time or do you just sweep it under the rug and continue uh, so I think it's like a combination of the two. I think the way you try to do it is if it's not an egregious mistake, you just kind of try to, in your next sentence, say the truth about what just happened while continuing forward. So if they say like, oh, no punish on that move right there, and it's like actually a punishable move, you have to say like, oh yeah, well, the EX version of that move is actually safe. So instead of trying to punish, he like challenged after, or you know what I mean? Like you try to like package it in. You don't want to just be like, all right, everybody stop. Uh, lights down, camera stop. All right, <laughs> you're just wrong. How does it feel to just be the wrongest person ever? Like, you know what I mean? You just want to kind of keep it moving. So if it's a very important thing that you need to say, like, hey, this is a key part here. This is actually 
like this and not like what was just said that can happen. But I think in general, you want to kind of try to point them in the right direction. It's like a, a good example of this is like when someone comes on stream and they're, tr someone's trying to say their name. So they're like, Oh yeah, this person's on. I, I think his name is Flame. And you're like, yeah, so flame here, he's a local <laughs> player. He's going to be coming up. And then your co-commentator is like, yeah, so flame, he's, he's really good. You know? So you kind of like <laughs> try to give them a hint by saying it right yourself so that maybe they'll catch on. That's kind of the usual strategy, I think, unless it's something that you just need to everybody to stop and, and be like, all right, <laughs> that's just not right. Yeah, that's super smart. And also a way to like kind of not be a butthead about it. So that's yeah. also good because you got to be on the mic with this person for the remainder of your block. So if you kick off, <laughs> you know, rubbing feathers, it's like not going to go well. It's going to strangle you with the mic cable and there's going to be a fight <laughs> and that might get a lot of views, but it's not the best for the stream and it's not the best for the show, you know, so. Exactly. All right. So here's another good one about co-commentators that I even feel like I've accidentally been uh, guilty of myself, but uh, how do you adjust when your co-commentator doesn't know how to take turns or talks too long? Yeah, that one is really tough. I, I think you kind of have to dance around them a bit. Uh, you know, it's hard often. A lot of times there are people, like you say, where they just like bulldoze through people. And sometimes I'm sure either of us have done it ourselves, uh, somebody else without realizing either because you're really invested in the match or you don't realize how much you're talking or it's very easy to do this online, right? With a desync, like, uh, you know, you're trying to talk to someone else and you can't tell if they're talking or not. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you kind of have to dance around it and either insert yourself in ways where you really want to speak or like, you know, when you want to stop talking pass pass to them right so just say like yeah i think right there that was a really nice anti-air uh you know like do you think maybe he could change up his jump bar with a dive kick or something persia like you know you end the sentence with their name to try to hand them the conversation i think that's an interesting way to do it but yeah i think in general it, it is quite tough I, I just have kind of naturally a habit as a commentator when another human being starts speaking to me i just stop talking <laughs> i can't help myself like it's just a natural reflex so I think that kind of reflex is important to train into yourself. And also just keep in mind when other people are with you that it is a shared microphone space. As much stuff as you want to say, the other person has, you know, all of that info and all those things that they want to say. So you have to be sure to be mindful of sharing the space, but also like, you know, you got to get in there. If you just never get heard, then you're just not speaking at all. And that's no fun. So, you know, you have to try to find the right balance. Definitely. And honestly, I feel like when it comes to fighting game commentary in particular, there's more room for talking over each other to happen because it's hype and because, you know, you're both commentators and you're not only focused on the match, but when you see something crazy, you know, that thought process and that esports casterness kind of goes out the window. I yeah. mean, I've seen some other, um, you know, esports games and their casters and they always seem very like segmented like you'll hear the first caster and then it's very clear that they're talking for this amount of time and then you hear the next caster so what's your take on you know kind of leaving in a very specific time for your co-commentator to talk or just going with that flow where you guys occasionally are talking over each other and then you know when to reel it back I think it really depends on the style of yourself and your co-commentator and like kind of what both of you feel comfortable with you know uh, a lot of people have mentioned and I see people mentioning this in the chat as well like holding up your hands or using hand signs to signify to each other. That's really common in other esports as well. And people use that a lot. So I think that's one way to talk with each other. But if you're with someone who is like really quiet, except for when they have analysis and they expect you to handle everything else, then I think taking turns like that is fine. You know, and if you're with somebody who you really gel with and passing back and forth is easy, then I think you should kind of maybe take that method. It really depends on who you're with and the kind of event it is and kind of what, style both of you are comfortable with because everybody's different every event is different every style of commentary is different so it's really nice to be able to blend and mix in with other people commentary is not an exact science um you know which is why i like it because if it was science i wouldn't be any good at it so you kind of just have to figure out the human element of commentary and where they fit in and where you fit in and kind of the natural blend of that is an important part about getting used to it. And Seg was mentioning, you know, how difficult it is to do solo commentary earlier. And it is an incredibly difficult challenge, but it's a completely different set of skills than commentating with another person. And so gelling with someone is a set of skills you have to learn. And it's going to be trial and error. There will be plenty of times where you and another person just do not mesh. You talk all over each other. It doesn't work. You, you know, your commentary styles don't work well together. That's just going to happen. And you kind of have to experiment until it sort of clicks and you know what you need to do. 
All right. So do you have strategies for handling getting paired with a commentator that you already know you guys don't really mesh well with each other? Yeah, I think I had way more strategies when I was not as uh, well-rounded as a commentator. When I was a little bit more like pointed in what my skill set was, I think I had a lot of strategies to deal with it. But these days, it's kind of, you know, I do a lot of prep about who I'm going to commentate with. So if it's someone I know is going to be very analytical, then I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, trying to be excitable and get them to talk and get it to be like a really kind of nerdy, but exciting conversation about the game. So even if they're an analytical commentator to get them excited about being a nerd, which is what they specialize in. And if they're a really excitable commentator, I try to give them a lot of space, let them be exciting. And then after they get out all this really hype energy and like there's this big moment following on that energy and making sure that it still feels connected and that my analysis has as much energy as their, you know, big moment. And then I hand it back to them quickly. You know, we have so many excellent hype commentators that it's important to remember to let them have their big moments, say something really small about what you want to say. Oh, that was actually a really nice thing. And then just get out of there. You know, it's <laughs> like, uh, you're like a mouse sneaking in to get like a little bit of cheese and then you have to run for your life. You know, you just got to get that little bit out there and then get out of there before anybody notices you. Um, so we had a good question in the chat. Um, and then before we move on to other aspects of commentary besides your co-commentator. And the question is, is it reasonable to ask a co-commentator to spend a couple of hours practicing with you? Especially if it's like your first time you're going to be commentating with this person. Usually you get a commentary schedule ahead of time. Do you think that's a reasonable ask? And is that something that you would do? Uh, I think a couple of hours is probably a lot. But I do think that meeting up with people and like kind of talking and being familiar with how they are as a person is very important, right? Because, you know, if you've never talked to someone before, and then you commentate with them, it's a lot harder than if you have like a natural kind of feeling for how they like to discuss. So even if you just find your co-commentator, and you ask them about their day about their travel about how they you know was getting to the tournament, you kind of get a feel for their rhythm as a person and how they like to speak and that kind of stuff. So I think as long as you have that kind of time to build that, it helps a lot. Just having a five, 10 minute conversation with someone will go a long way, uh, you know, to improve it rather than just having like you jump on commentary for the first time. You're both sitting there nervous right before it starts and you're like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. Okay. All right, everybody. Welcome to this <laughs> event. That is like so much harder to do, you know? Yeah. And, you know, if the time does not allow, maybe go watch their reel and you can yeah. get a feel for what their style is through their own eyes and then how you can improve on that. So we're going to keep it moving because we have a ton of really, really good questions that I want to jump into. And this is going to be more towards about the events themselves, the events that you might be applying for, so on and so forth. So um, the first one is, what are some commentary like red flags when it comes to gigs? Oh, when it comes to gigs. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think a lot of the time it is being unclear about breaks unclear about payment unclear about like the the uh you know simple things that you require as a human stuff like uh, hey so i don't see a schedule here when am i on from am i on from here to here when's my break when am i going to do this and they're like oh you know it's kind of a loosey goosey schedule we'll figure out when you can have it you'll have a break sometime we'll, try, we'll figure it out every time i've ever been told we'll figure out when you'll have a break there'll be a natural break point I've never had a break. So that's just something to keep in mind. Sure. <laughs> uh, if they say, we'll figure it out, they're not going to figure it out. Uh, there's plenty of other more important things to, for them to deal with than getting you a break. And also just being you know, upfront about what you want as a commentator. So when you start to be a commentator who gets paid to do stuff and you start asking people about payment and stuff, the more they push that off and the less you know clear they are with you about that, I think that's important. And the other big red flag to me, and I talked about this recently on my stream actually, is when you get asked to do events that are not your specialty. So I was asked to do commentary for two different games that I don't really know recently. And I was like, hey, so I don't know either of these games. Uh, I'm not familiar with either of them. I don't want to do the event because that doesn't make sense, but I can recommend you people who I think are fantastic. I'll give you like two to three names for each one. And, you know, if you want a certain like time zone or a certain place, I, I can recommend you some people that are great. And they were like, oh, it doesn't matter if you're not an expert. We just love to have you on. And I was like, no, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. I was like, uh, I'm okay, but, you know, here's my recommendations. And later on, I was watching the event and I was like, man, I'm happy that I didn't say yes because I can't just imagine doing that event and being in that environment where they were just okay with me not knowing anything and I just like 
man, that is just such a strange thing to me. So, you know, making sure that you're open and honest with your communication and expecting the same from the people who are hiring you and the people who are working on the events, I think is really important. So you touch on something that I think is very important, right? You're an upcoming commentator, you've been on the grind and congrats, you just got offered your first paid gig and they ask you, so what's your rate? How do you come up with a rate when you've never had a paid gig before for this? Nine times out of 10, you never expected you would get paid to do this at some point. And now you're on the spot and you have to measure your worth in a monetary value to a company that can potentially give, you know, solidify your spot in turning this hobby into a career, right? So what's your thought on rates? How can people find a good rate for them? Yeah, you enter a dangerous position. That's when like the hat comes down, you put the toothpick in your mouth, a tumbleweed like, you know, spins by and they're like, what's your rate? And you're like, what's your price and like you guys go back and forth like passing like how much money can you offer me and it's like well what do you want and you just like pass that baton back and forth that never feels good so I think like it's one of those situations where there's plenty of ways to approach it so first of all if you have no idea what the standard rate for an event is at all you should ask and in particular you should ask people you know have worked with that company before so I've had people come to me before and say hey you know I'm working with this big company and I know you've worked with them before what are your rates with them, right? Or what do you work with? Uh, When you work with them in the past, what did you expect from them and stuff like that? So just be open and discuss with other co-commentators you know who have worked with these people before or who have you know, had experience working in the past in that industry and see if you can find somebody around to, you know, discuss this with. And also, if you're getting hired for an event, they're not just hiring you, correct? They're hiring other people along with you. So find out who else is being hired alongside you, maybe even asking them and see if they'll tell you. A lot of the times they'll say, hey, these are the people we're considering. So just maybe ask them and come together and agree on a rate that to you sounds fair. And when I say sounds fair, I don't mean just for the commentators, but also for the company, right? Like you don't want to ask, you know, a company who is very small, like a local event or a regional event, we want $1 million. Like it doesn't make sense. <laughs> you you want to make sure that the rate is fair for the commentators, but also fair for the people paying uh, for the commentators as well. So, you know, just be reasonable about speaking with the other people who are getting hired about being honest and open with the people you're being hired, uh, who are hiring you from the event. And also just, you know, ask around in the community. I've had plenty of people ask me, hey, I'm working with this company. You've worked with them in the past. What did they pay you or anything? Yeah. <laughs> and you <laughs> just like, like I asked you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I that was the exact thing I was thinking about is like you just tell them you're like, this is exactly what I asked for. I asked for this much and they said no. I asked for this much and they said yes. So I think like, you know, most of the time there is no incentive for other commentators to lie to you. They'll just be like, okay, this is exactly what I, I got paid because my hope is that. I can tell you what I got paid and then we can get paid the same thing. And then everybody else gets a great rate, right? At the end of the day, that is the goal is that everybody ends up happy getting paid for something that they, you know, have earned and also deserve. Exactly. Honestly, I feel like that's just such a big thing. I know when I got my first like real hosting gig, like outside of commentary, I didn't know what to ask for. I wasn't sure it was in the Barclays center and I asked for $150 a day (laughs) and immediately afterwards, the production manager pulled me aside and mind you, this was after the event and after they accepted my rate, he pulls me aside and goes, all right, you need to immediately raise that to XYZ dollar amount. I don't want to expose uh, this person's recommendation for me, but yeah, yeah, they immediately pulled me aside and was like, you need to raise the rate. You just need to. And um, it can be really hard, especially when this is not something you're doing full time. It's something you've been doing for fun or, you know, out of the love of the game. And you're always worried when it's something like that to ask for too much and then to get passed up on. But yes, I truly think we're at the point where people also take that sign of asking too little as a sign of an experience. And sometimes yes. they don't want to work with you either. Have you had any uh, experiences with that? Yeah, definitely. I like you said, I've definitely seen other people I know who at the event, like say like, you know, I only asked for this much money for this event or something like that happens. And it is definitely a sign of inexperience. If you offer to work for free, or if you offer to work for a very low rate, that can come off worse than somebody who offers a real rate. So if you know, two people sign up for an event, 
you would think the automatic assumption would be like, that's person's cheaper, we should hire them. But when they look at it, they're like, why is their price so low? You know, when you go to the store and you're shopping around and you're like, oh, okay, this is like a $7, you know, whatever this is, this one is $3. What's wrong with this one? Why is this one $3? Like, you know what I mean? You kind of think about it in that way that why would this cost so much less you it's one of those you get what you pay for kind of things and when you come together on rates it really helps make sure that that doesn't happen and uh like you say i definitely know about situations where people have asked for too little and there are obviously situations where people ask for too much and i think the important thing is every time you ask for something whatever your new highest rate is that is something you have to remember right so when you get paid you know, this amount of day, you think to yourself, okay, this is my max day rate. When I'm working with companies I know have money, I've been paid this before. I know that I deserve this rate, right? I worked with somebody and this is the rate I've earned. So you're, you should always have in mind, I think kind of your day rate that you are at a minimum and the day rate where you want a maximum. You know what I mean? You have like kind of a range and keeping that range in mind and communicating with other commentators will always like kind of let you have a ballpark range in your head at all times about what you would want for something, you know? Exactly. All right, so let's switch gears here a little bit and talk about improving our own styles, right? It can be really easy to get caught up in, you know, oh, am I being too analytical? Am I being too, you know, color, too play-by-play? How do you find that balance if you don't really know what your commentary style is yet? Yeah, I would say that finding your commentary style is incredibly important. And I think most people will find it even if they don't recognize it. You know, so if you think about any game uh, that you play, everybody that, you know, wants to commentate video games generally plays video games. If you think about video games, you probably have a style, right? If if a big enemy runs up to you with a weapon and they swing at you, what are you going to do? Are you just going to stand there and take it? Are you just going to, you know, try to block it? Are you going to try to roll? Are you going to try to parry? What is your style of a video game player? And I think when you think about the kinds of things you like to do as a person, it reflects a lot of the times the kind of stuff you would like to do on commentary. So, you know, when you think like, what are the things you like about fighting games, for instance, right? Do you like the nitty gritty of things? Do you like watching big man go smash? Do you like just get excited about things? What keeps you interested about the game? Find the things you love about the game and what keeps you excited when you're watching it. And that's probably where your style comes from. You know, if you watch a scenario and you just like think to yourself, that was a cool light show and it got me really excited then you're probably there for the hype, right? You're probably someone who enjoys things that are flashy. You probably get excited at seeing big plays. That's probably what your interest is. So figuring out your style is very important. And when you figure out your style, then I think focusing on improving that is maybe the most important thing because there is a point where you do have to diversify a bit, I think, and start to become more well-rounded. But really hammering in and being uh, an expert at whatever you enjoy, whatever your style is, I think is important first. And then kind of getting good at other things is nice. And I, I know for me, for instance, I'm like a super analytical commentator. I heavily focused on improving my analysis for a long time before I ever even was like, okay, I should probably not sound like a, you know, a piece of wood when I go out there where I'm just like reading frame data from a sheet you know, in my brain. You don't want that at all. So you know, I, I think focus on your strengths and then your weaknesses, you'll fix them later when you have time. You know, I think that's the way to think about it. Awesome. So now that we've discussed a lot with the chat, we got to put you guys to the test really quick. Have you been paying attention? We're going to slap a poll on your screen right now for everyone in the webinar. And the question is, what are you most guilty of? Talking too fast, not knowing the game or community well enough, too critical or showing bias, or being too nervous? Or the ghost all of the above answer that I would be mashing right now if yep. it was there. <laughs> All of the above. (laughs) All of the above. Go ahead and submit your answers. Obviously, all of these things are stuff like to look out for. Um, Yeah. But some of us might be leaning towards one thing more than the other. Let's see what we've got. Ooh, pretty even spread here. 34% to talking too fast. 38% to not knowing the game and community well enough. 21% to showing bias. And 7% to too nervous, which is actually a good thing. Because then that means you guys are in the right uh, space because you don't want to be nervous on commentary. Nine times out of 10, you're on the mic already because you, you know, have general knowledge. You're great. People like you, like you said already, you're already there. So (laughs) no need to be nervous about it. Um, Let's go ahead and hit you guys with another poll because I just want to make sure we're paying attention before we bring Seg back in for the group Q&A. And the question is, how do you prep 
for tournaments? Do you study the players and community or lore, practice your improv, get a full night's rest, or all of the above? Go ahead and place your answers. Um, if you've been paying attention, this one should be easy peasy. So let's see. One thing I will say, sleep is definitely important. You mentioned it earlier, and I thought I'd share that recently. I found out sleep debt isn't real, and not only was I devastated, but now I just like care so much more about my sleep knowing that I can't make it up later. <laughs> you know, that is like the funniest. Th sleep debt is a great term right like you're like i'll just sleep extra the next day to like make up for the sleep debt. that's awesome sleep debt is a really cool term but it doesn't exist and my heart breaks but let's see those answers and boom 88 percent on all of the above a few here and there for studying players and getting rest but you know still technically right in its own way but definitely yeah. all of the above all right, you guys, we are going to bring Chris Seglia back into the fold because we have even more questions that you guys have sent. And we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible. But some of these are really great for everyone to answer and put their input into. So welcome back, Seg. Hi. Hi. Um, all right. So we have some really good questions here that can kind of, you know, get some, we can get some good insight from the both of you. And um, the first one is, what is an optimal pathway for making connections as a commentator, aside from sending out your reel to known production teams and or tournament organizers? We can start off with you, Seg, since people will likely be sending you stuff. <laughs> Don't be an asshole is probably my number one rule. Um, <laughs> You know, people, when they're networking, they you usually want something from them uh, as far as, like, you're you're a commentator, so you want a job, right? Uh, don't be an asshole uh, is probably my number one rule with working with anybody. And, uh, you know, not a lot of people have actually passed that test. So uh, that's my suggestion is to be nice, to be friendly. Say Jam, actually, he's... Uh, he said earlier that he, wa or he goes to production, says hi, and all this stuff. But, you know, it's... You should should read the room and see when you're uh when you should come and say hi yeah uh, tensions are always high at, at a tournament but you know sometimes uh you know is there's good times and there's bad times for sure yeah sometimes i walk in and i there's two things if everybody's mad either i recognize that i can be a shoulder to lean on or i recognize that if i stand in a certain place i will be run over and trampled and no one will find my body like it will never be reported like an among us body on the floor so you know you need to see where it is in the middle but i would say in terms of uh, networking and stuff like that you know i've done a lot of of commentary in my life and as far as networking goes i always just try to do commentary do a good job and people naturally afterwards will say, hey, oh, yeah, I saw you on that event or I saw you on that thing. You did a great job. And I just say, yeah, you know, I had a lot of fun doing that. And I just kind of build relationships naturally. I would say if you go pursuing networking, like, like Seg said, you can tell people want something. When they walk up to you and they're like, oh, my goodness gracious, Christopher Seglia, I just love the way your hair looks in this fine afternoon. Like, it it's like, like all right, we know right something's now. going on here. So, <laughs> uh, you know, just be a normal, normal person and uh, do a great job. And when you see people at events, say hi. And if you like them, be nice to them. If you don't like them, just go play video games or something else instead, and you'll probably be okay. Awesome. So um, our next question, I think... Uh, can kind of be molded towards the both of you. And that question is, do you look at the chat when you're commentating? And I'm going to morph it a little bit for you, Seg. Do you pay attention to what people are saying in the chat about your commentators? And we can start with Say Jam on this one. Do not look at the chat while you commentate. It will influence your commentary one way or another. Either you will look at the chat and somebody will be making fun of you and they're like, say jam talks too fast. And then it'll come back to me and I'll be like, well, the thing is, and that's bad. Or it'll be something very nice. Like say jam's hair looks good today. I'll be like, Hey, what up guys? Welcome back to cat. And that's not good either. So like you shouldn't read it because there's a million hours that you can go read it after the event's over. Don't look at the chat. It will influence your commentary and you should do commentary without looking at it because it's a distraction. You shouldn't be playing Overwatch or, you know, some game on your computer while you're commentating. Focus on the game and you'll be okay. Yeah, I forbid it for uh, for most of the, the events that we do. Uh, some people put like we have this, what we call a preview monitor. Some people put the chat up on the preview monitor. I immediately yell at them when that happens. I've also had to take away phones. Uh, there was one top eight at Evo where they were just looking at the chat and they were not doing uh, 
because they were getting criticized pretty heavily and they were, it was screwing with their head. So I literally took away their phone and I uh, almost threw it off the balcony and um, they did better. So, uh, you know, it chat kind of gets in your head, like what say James says. And um, they're also the vocal minority too. Um, so for a commentator, I would, you know, you definitely don't need to read the chat. You should be focused on what's going on on the stream or on the screen. Um, production wise, we have the chat open in case there's a technical problem going on. Usually there's F's in the chat. If there's like a, you know, frame drops or something like that, that means that we got to fix it. Uh, if, uh, they are criticizing, uh, the way that a commentator is commentating, um, you know, no, I don't, I don't look at that at all. All right, so our next question, um, it is in regards to a reel, but I feel like it's also worth talking about in live commentary as well, because we talk a lot about these events, how they can be different, vibes are different. That's why commentators per gig or event um, are chosen the way that they are. But this question was, um, I curse like a sailor sometimes when I practice commentary and stuff like that. Um, so. The question is basically thoughts on cursing in your reel and I'm morphing the question a little more into thoughts on cursing on the mic live as well. Let's start with Seg on this one. Sorry, I lagged out. What was the, the last <laughs> part of it? Um, thoughts on cursing in someone's reel and cursing at a live event, like on the mic. So if you are sending me an edited reel uh, and you can't be very professional in your reel, uh, there's a very little chance that I'm going to give you a, a, a gig. Um, cursing during a live event, I am very lenient on that, like incredibly lenient. In fact, that I think that, um, uh, you know, like during CBT events and during, um, during tech and world tour events and all that stuff, I don't have a, a cursing uh, limit basically, or a, a, a mandate. I just basically say, you better make it count. Um, because if you just curse normally, like I curse all the time, and I'm very surprised that I haven't yet. Um, if you just do it in casual conversation, you know, there, it's not worth it essentially to do that. So just try to be as professional as possible. And, um, you know, sometimes the moment just takes itself away, but there are, you know, different clients that, that we, uh, that we um, have and, you know, work with that wants complete PG commentary or G commentary uh, and zero cursing allowed. Not even like you can't even say uh, a word that's even close to it. So I would just, you know, try to be as professional as possible. Man, you know, I've definitely been told you're not allowed to say damn before. And you know how hard it is to avoid the word damn. <laughs> and like, there was like, they were not okay because of shoot. And I was like, I'm running out of that. Gee, golly willikers. Like, I was like, I don't know what to say. But yeah, for me, I don't curse a lot when I commentate, if almost ever, right? It's very rare for me to curse on commentary uh, at all. But on my stream, I curse an incredible amount. And uh, it's just kind of like a switch you flick in your head. Like, if you ever think about when you walk into like, I don't know, your parents' house or something, you know, like you just stop cursing. Or remember when you were young and you couldn't curse in front of your parents? Maybe you can now if you're older. Um, or if you walk into like church or like, you know, you walk into like a place where everybody else, you're just like, I can't say, I have to be very nice here and not say anything that's going to like offend anybody. So you don't want to like curse just for no reason, right? So that kind of switch sort of flicks in your head, I think, when you're on commentary. So for me, I don't find it difficult, but I know there are some people who really struggle not to curse. It's just so built into them as people. So yeah, I mean, I, I would just consider it. You don't have to like censor yourself all the time, right? It's very rare that that's the case, but yeah, I mean, not, not ever cursing is hard for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. And another important thing to know is because I'm totally with you there. Like I'll be on the mic at an event, everything's well. Then we go to the salty, sweet Marvel room, you know, laptop stream set up with the little mic that no one can probably hear me on and I'm, I'm losing it. But the important thing to remember is even though those are two completely different streams and yeah, it might be okay for me to let a few fly in the salty, sweet stream, um, all that stuff is still going to be online 
someone will still be able to find it and view yeah. it out of context. It could be really bad. And just keep that in mind. It might be fun. And with context, yeah, we're all laid back, chilling. Not a big deal. But we all know how much a few seconds out of a few hours long stream can be uh, the end of us all. So yeah, just keep that in mind as well. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit um, because I, I feel like this is something that's important now. And it's about you know, getting noticed for your commentary or your content creation when you're first starting out. You know, it's one thing, like for us back then, someone's like, hey, you over there, like come be on the mic compared to now where someone may have already been on the mic a few times, but they don't know how to set apart their future content, right? The foot's in the door. We talked about that a lot, but what are the next steps here? Uh, we'll start with Sage. <laughs> yeah, I, I think in most cases, if your foot is in the door and you're already sort of getting accepted for local, regional, larger events, you're on the right track, right? You're kind of already there. So I think you should continue doing the things that have made you like get those opportunities and just focus on pushing towards that if that's your interest, right? As long as that's the stuff you want to do, I think you should just focus on you know, moving forward and making sure that you continue to do that. As far as like to separate yourself or make yourself look unique or anything like that, I would just say that whatever you do, if you're getting opportunities for it, people like it. So you should just continue doing the stuff that people resonate with and that people like and that you enjoy doing. I don't think you should ever turn yourself into a kind of commentator who does things specifically because it does well with other people, but you don't like doing it or like, you know what I mean? I, I don't think that that's ever what your goal should be. I would say just to make sure that you continue doing the things that got you there. So continue commentating a lot, continue practicing as much as you can and prepping and uh, you know, just being seen at, at events that are larger and larger and make sure that you keep up with the scene and community. Try not to fall behind. Just like you get a few gigs and you're like, all right, it's done. I'm at the top of the hill. This is it. I'm the best. Like, and then like you show up to the next tournament, you're like, who are all these people? Who's Diego Umajueras? You know, you don't want to like fall off completely. So yeah, just pay attention to what's going on and make sure to continue whatever brought you success, continue doing it. Yeah. I don't really have too much to add on to that. I just think that, um, you know, if you're got your foot in the door, you're already ahead of about 99% of the people there, right? So uh, just trust yourself and uh, just continue to work on what you think uh, you're doing. Uh, you know, what you think you're doing well. Nice. So I know I talked a little bit about rates with Sage M earlier, but the chat was actually curious from your point of view, Seg, about what you think a reasonable rate is for like an amateur commentator. Like if someone presents you a rate, what do you kind of looking for what's the ballpark and um you know how can someone kind of validate that that's what they're worth no there is no such thing as a as a rate like that uh uh what i do uh you know for for uh myself uh, as a freelancer because i still work in sports and uh, i freelance for a lot of different things is uh, i try to figure out an hourly like break down what i am worth hourly essentially um and uh, try to figure that out. And if is it worth it that I spent a hundred hours prepping plus uh, the fifteen hours of uh, of commentary or whatever it is, uh, you know, just working? Is that worth the the hundred and fifty dollars a day that Persia uh, did? You know, yes to some people, no to some people, right? So you know, it is what it is. Uh, you just kind of have to figure out what is worth it for you. And I do suggest uh, what Sejan talked about and just kind of figuring out what you got from your peers. To, to add on to that too, yeah, what Seg says is very important in that the time that you are commentating live is not the only time taken up. There's travel days that you have to consider, right? There is the fact that you'll be missing work or perhaps you're a streamer or content creator. Do you do something else that you'll have to miss as well? There's the fact that while you're at the event, you can't be somewhere else doing some other thing. So if you get offered two different events at the same time, one is more money, but requires travel days. One is less money, but doesn't require travel days. You know, you have to consider that stuff as well. That's why it's common when you're asking for rates to ask for half your day rate on days you have to travel, for instance, stuff like that, or half day rate for rehearsal days that you have to spend time not doing that. So, you know, any way that you have to spend time preparing or traveling or at the event or in there, you know, there in person or rehearsing, any of that kind of stuff is time that is committed. It's not just 
oh, you know, you're only going to be on stream for like two hours a day. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to be on stream two hours, but I have to fly to Japan, be there for three days, rehearse, and then come back. So it's not quite two days on stream. And then my, my schedule is going to be messed up and I can't do that. Like, you know, you really have to consider the total time investment, not only to like get ready for the on-air part, but also getting there and doing it and all that kind of stuff. So your day rate always has to be, you know, a reflection of the total hours you're going to put in, not just, hey, you're going to be on screen for 30 minutes. Anybody could talk for 30 minutes minutes like you know you have to really think about the reality of the situation i think exactly and um this kind of leads into my next question um because i think it's something important that people should take into consideration but uh you know we can start with you sejam on this one but what are your thoughts on commentary truly being uh an end goal career and if you're leaning towards you know, that it might not really be an end goal career. What are ways that someone can use all of these talents, all of this experience in commentary to get something, you know, that is more end goal and in, is more like, a, you know, the peak of your career? Yeah, so I think in other esports, there's plenty of people who have made commentary an end goal career. I think in fighting games, it's very difficult. There's very few people, I think, who can make a livable wage that they feel super happy with doing fighting game commentary full time. If fighting games is your only focus, right? I think there's very few of us. I said earlier that, like, I think in the chat that it's maybe, maybe five people or something. It could be less, honestly. And uh, I mean, even for me, for instance, I'm someone who... Uh, you know, I would say like in previous years, for instance, 80 to 85% of my income is from commentary. I traveled like 40 weeks a year or so to do events, right? So I, I was traveling a lot to do events. And so for me, I felt good about the amount of money I was making. I was very happy with it. Then this year comes and obviously no one can travel anywhere. And even though I was a content creator, I would estimate that I lost at least 30% of the income that I would have made last year traveling or would have made this year traveling and stuff uh, just as like a start, right? So even though I've been streaming every single day, I have a large stream on Twitch, one of the largest fighting game streams and my stream performs really well and the content I'm, I'm creating is, uh, you know, having a lot of success and I'm doing online events still, there's like probably a minimum 30% loss in income for the year. Now, that being said, for me, I was making enough money that I don't think that matters so much. But for other commentators who are not, you know, like making a ton of content or have a lot of gigs or are we're already at the top of the commentary food chain and getting a lot of opportunities, it is a little shaky, right? And in, in terms of commentary as an end goal, for me, I think I can continue doing commentary for as long as I like it and it makes enough money and I like content creation alongside of it enough to be okay. I think in other esports, especially you're seeing transitions where people do commentary for a long time and because of their expertise in the scene, familiarity with players and familiarity with the like esports around it, they become general managers of teams or coaches for teams or they become, uh, they work on the esports side with the developer or a publisher, or they work with like the brand on, you know, creating leagues or structures or being a liaison or a consultant of some kind. So I think there are transitional jobs that you can find in other companies. And in fact, like for instance, I was offered a job to be a fighting game coach for a team, right? So they offered me like a full year salary and like a full thing to do coaching for a team, right? So I think there are other opportunities and stuff, but uh, it, it is probably, you know, like all money, more likely to happen in other esports that are larger than in fighting games in particular but definitely not off the table and what about your thoughts on it seg yeah i mean so esports as a as a industry has only been around for less than 10 years right uh the when i first started out this was like teaching people how to to make television and um you know, it, we we have no idea how this industry is going to be. So if you want it to be a end goal for you, uh, it might be an end goal for you today, but tomorrow, you know, uh, it you might be uh -oh. right or a general manager. Yeah, see how my internet's going. Bob, uh, <laughs> I think you're good now. A little yeah. bit, yeah, you're back. You might be presented with an opportunity to be a general manager the next day or something like that. So I would. I would make it a goal for sure, but I don't think that um, it's realistic for you to think that commentary is going to be an end goal, whether you're making the amount of money that you want to or if you're just starting out. Yeah, I would say it's a, especially in our community, it's a very small percentage of people mm -hmm. for sure. And I, I don't expect that number to go up in the next year or year and a half. It's It's not high. I think like you have to be 
near the top and work constantly and have other opportunities available to you if you want to take them to succeed. And you have to work incredibly hard and get hired a lot and maybe even do a lot of different games. Exactly. Like, you know, it sounds really great to be like, yeah, I'm doing commentary full time, but you peel back that mask and it's like the whole iceberg of stress and anxiety that builds up underneath it. And, you know, I, I asked this question because, you know, I'm working my dream job now at GameSpot, which is amazing. And honestly, every day I'm so like, I cannot believe that I have this job. And it really is all because of my start in the FGC and me having this experience and getting the opportunity throughout the years to work with bigger brands and work, you know, big events. And then to be able to showcase that, even though I know it's only in the FGC, which might be smaller than many esports, there's plenty of influencers out there with massive followings, which is a side note, don't ever compare yourself to other people's numbers, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, you know, it's easy to feel like, man, is this enough? But there are, you know, careers out there. The games industry is huge. And a lot of people, like Sex said, esports is new. And, you know, people are starting to notice now and people want to be a part of that. And, you know, you know, maybe five year, years ago, I never would have thought I would have this job. And, you know, even five years ago, I was still putting myself in debt. You know, people always talk about or maybe not see how much grinding and years goes into getting yourself to a point in commentary that you can live off of it. Um, but it really is difficult. You know, in the beginning, first three, four years, I was doing, you know, going to these events and doing commentary for absolutely free because I loved it. I got a credit card. I'm not recommending this to anybody, by the way, but I got a credit <laughs> card. I put all my travel expenses, all my commentary stuff, the hotel rooms, or me paying a little bit to a friend to sleep on their floor just so I can make sure that I'm there. I did that for years and then finally got a paid gig for it right at the same time where I was like, oh, I'm going to like accept this more advanced position at this day job I, I was miserable at. You know, it was a lot going on and it was like that for years before it ever got to a point where I actually felt like I could survive off of it. Then I still kind of felt like I took the plunge too soon um, because at that time, at least, getting paid on time was a very big issue. You know, yeah. your rent does not change dates, but this quote unquote, you know, time limit that you have and you're expecting the money to come in and it doesn't. And now you're like, oh no, like, what am I supposed to do? This is so much different than my day job where I knew exactly what day this was going to come, you know, and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of it underneath the mask and it's a lot of grinding but when you love it as much as you do none of that matters and then when you finally get to a position where you can make it everything you're doing every day it feels that much better this position at GameSpot I did not ever think this position would exist it was the first time ever in my entire life even my day jobs that I read a job listing and not only did I meet every requirement but I exceeded it all because of the years and work and experience I put in in the FGC who would have thought but because of all that, it did lead to something more and it helped me figure out what I liked to do and what my strengths were and what I could do beyond the FGC, even though I still love the FGC so much. I miss commentary so much, but at the same time, being able to like grow and learn even more all thanks to the FGC is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like in your case, especially too, when people would always ask like, why don't fighting games have a lot of interviews or hosting and stuff, right? people would always say like, yeah, we have people who can do it. Like Persia, Persia's great at it. Why doesn't she just do it, right? Like, you know, she does a lot of commentary, but she's such a great host. And I think that's a great example of like a skill set that you had in fighting games that like perhaps it was harder to always find work for that somewhere else. They're like, oh my God, she's perfect. You know what I mean? So that is like a great example of something like that where like for me, for instance, I've done desk hosting uh, a lot, right? But in fighting games, we don't have a lot of desk hosting and other like, uh, two or three different genres have reached out to me and asked if I wanted to host desks for them. They're like, we don't need you to be an expert or anything. You just have a lot of experience like doing the traffic of a show, right? So like, we're interested in that. So yeah, I think what you mentioned is important too, that as much as you love fighting games, it's important to remember what your skill set is and what you love to do and being okay with pivoting, you know? Yeah, if you can make it as a fighting game commentator, uh, you're pretty uh, you're pretty good. Um, <laughs> it, fighting game commentary is hard. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, like, like what you said, being a desk host, uh, you had the opportunity to do that, uh, Persia being a, a sideline reporter essentially for, for some, uh, for some companies, uh, that stuff is hard. I've, I talked to a lot of different esports commentators and they're like, 
I have no idea how you can be funny, analytical, uh, knowledgeable, and all this stuff uh, all at once. Um, it's incredibly hard. Like, you know, even huge esports people are in awe of Say Jam Yipes and, you know, everybody. So. All right, so I am going to shoot one last question to you guys here. Um, and I know I'm going to get, or I might get two different answers since both of you have a different take on it, but we'll start with Sejam. What are your thoughts on when you commentate your voice playing on the in-house mic? Oh, uh, yeah, I don't mind. I'm used to it, but I think it's a different experience uh, because when the crowd can hear you, they're going to react to the things that you're saying and it's going to influence them a lot in the way that all commentary naturally does to the viewers and whoever can hear you and stuff. I try not to change my commentary in terms of like saying, oh, that move is unsafe and you missed the punish. And like, you know, people say like, what if the players hear me? And like the things that I say influence how the players play. And it's like, if they need your help, if they have time in the match to hear you and receive your help, then it might be forlorn anyway, right? Like who knows even what's going to happen, but I don't mind. I think it's a different set of skills often when you do it. And that's why you need someone like, for instance, for me, I'm not going to be like, all right, guys, everybody get loud. Like, that's not me. I just can't do it. It's not, there's not a bone in my body that can make a crowd yell, but you pair me with someone like Steve who just yells, make some noise and everybody gets hyped. Right. So there, there is a balance there. Right. I can't, I can't be the guy that's like, everybody, we're going to do the cell scream. Ah, like it doesn't work. I can't do, I'm sorry. That's not a skill that I possess. And I don't know, I could go in the mountains and sit there for like, you know, and meditate and I would never get it. So uh, you know, who you are and like how you can play off of a crowd really will depend on your skill set and who you are and that kind of stuff, right? So uh, yeah, it, it is a different set of skills and I don't mind it either way. If I'm going to be pumped with the crowd, awesome. If I'm not going to be pumped with the crowd, awesome. I'm okay with it no matter what. Uh, this is a fight that I've lost uh, over the years. Uh, I I don't mind it as a viewer, right? Actually, I like it as a viewer, but I do think that it uh, affects um the experience for sure. Um, so for example, what I do in an ideal scenario um, at Evo, uh, we have two sets of commentators. Uh, this, we have the stream commentators who are um, only going out to the, the world, essentially only going out to the world. You're going out to the world. Uh, and then you have the people who are doing in-house commentary because it's two completely different uh, skill sets. And to me, uh, it feels weird uh, on a stream for people to make some noise uh, <laughs> for uh, for people in in house, right? Uh, so that's why I try to separate it and uh, try to uh, do that. But you know, uh, budgets are budgets, and you can't really do that uh, for for a lot of things. Um, it's just something that I really push for at Evo, and I think that it's it works out pretty well. Awesome. That's well, I was just going to say on that topic, that's why I will never be the person that gets hired to do the in-house mic at Evo. <laughs> I just, it's not for me. You just, you sit me on the desk in the curtain, behind the curtain or whatever. And I talk into the mic, but the guy to be up on there, that's, that's not a good job for me for sure. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Which should shed some light maybe to some of the viewers. Maybe you're more of an in-house commentator. Maybe that's a way you can market yourself or tailor your reels or something like that. Um, I do feel like positions within commentary are expanding and you know I feel like hosting is an expansion of that too so interesting stuff all around thank you guys so so much for joining us and you know having this discussion I think it's super important I think we've covered just about everything and it's just really great to talk about this and actually hit some hard-hitting questions while we're at it so thank you guys so much yeah thank you for no having problem. us it was really fun yeah thanks thanks Capcom <laughs> All right, everyone, we hope that you have enjoyed the very first season of SF5 Street Smarts. This episode does conclude this season, but we hope you've learned a lot. We've covered so many different aspects of esports and Street Fighter and how to get better at all of it. And honestly, this is what we're here for. This is what we really, really enjoy. So if you've enjoyed the discussion and if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to us. Use the hashtag SFVStreetSmarts to stay in the discussion. And if you want to see any of the VODs or find out when this episode is going to be put up as a VOD, then make sure you're following the Capcom Fighters channels everywhere. Now, thank you guys so much and we will see you next time.